would like to acknowledge the Darug people, the traditional custodians of the land from which I am speaking today. I pay my respect to Elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people watching this premiere tonight. It is my pleasure to be introducing the launch event for Volume 44, Issue 3 of the University of New South Wales Law Journal, a part thematic issue on the topic Big Technology and the Law. I'm sure you can all appreciate that Big Tech is an extremely pressing issue at the moment and one that is already proving to be causing a major shake-up of not only our current laws, but also the legal industry itself. I would like to congratulate Lillian Wang, the editor for Issue 44.3, for proposing this thematic and for allowing the journal and its authors to contribute to this important discussion. I know Big Tech is something that Lillian is extremely passionate about. I can tell by the way that she, unlike the rest of the executive committee, actually knows how to use Excel, a skill that has proven to be exceedingly handy during our executive meetings. Other than her technical prowess in the Microsoft suite, Lillian is also one of the kindest, most hardworking people I know, and I am so proud of her achievement. The journal is very grateful for the support of Allens in this launch event. We are incredibly lucky to have Allens host this launch, being an industry leader in legal innovation. As I've mentioned in our previous launches, Allens continues to be one of our oldest sponsors and we are ever thankful for your willingness to support us. I would like to thank in particular Lisa Miller for your assistance in preparing for this launch and Valeska Block, partner at Allens and one of the leading legal minds in this field, for offering to deliver the welcome to the firm. I hope that we can be back celebrating in person in the Allens offices in the near future. Now I would like to thank our keynote speaker, Mr. Rod Sims, who is the chair of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, otherwise known as the ACCC. We are incredibly lucky to have secured Mr. Sims as our keynote speaker, considering the relevance of the ACCC to our thematic topic. According to Lillian, the ACCC was mentioned in four out of six thematic articles published. I look forward to hearing your speech, which I have no doubt will be extremely relevant to our current climate. I also look forward to hearing from some of our wonderful authors published in the part thematic component who will be participating in a Q&A session with Lillian. Lillian has been busy recording some very insightful interviews on Teams over the last few weeks, discussing a few of the articles published in this issue, and we thank each author for agreeing to partake in our launch event in this way. I would also like to extend my thanks to each and every author who has published in this issue, thematic and general. Thank you for entrusting the journal with your work and for working with us through the editing process. Without you, our publication would not be possible. Thank you to the UNSW Law and Justice faculty for your continual support of the journal. I would like to thank in particular Professor Andrew Lynch, Dean of the UNSW Law and Justice faculty, who will be delivering the vote of thanks. As always, I am ever grateful to our faculty advisors, Professors Rosalind Dixon and Gary Edmund, for your time, advice and encouragement in the day-to-day -day running of the journal. Special thanks must go to the rest of the Executive Committee, and I would like to welcome, in particular, Catherine Chang and Georgia Brigg, the newest members of our Executive Committee. I know I say this at every launch, but it continues to be true. I am so incredibly lucky to be working with such hardworking and intelligent people. I couldn't have asked for a better team to weather through the highs and lows of this year so far. Lastly, but definitely not least, I would like to extend a huge thank you and congratulations to the General Editorial Board. Thank you for your tireless and excellent work on the journal, and we really would not be here without you. I would like now to hand over to Valeska Block, partner at Allens, to welcome us to the firm. Hi everyone. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm recording this on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We at Allens are very proud to be a premier sponsor of the UNSW Law Journal. In fact, this marks the 40th year that Allens has, sponsor has sponsored the journal and it's the second time hosting an issue launch event in 2021. I'm a proud former UNSW student and have always had enormous respect for the journal. And as a technology lawyer, I'm particularly excited about this issue, big technology and the law. 
The pandemic has taught us many things, not least of which the fact that we are all incredibly connected and that now more than ever, technology is that connective tissue. It's having an enormous impact on politics, society, thinking and really all of the ways that we live and work. But we also know that the law is always playing catch up to technology and that's what's ma what makes the intersection between the two so fascinating. And with that, I'd like to congratulate Lillianne Wan, issue editor of this issue, and invite her to speak next. Thank you. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this speech is being filmed, the Bidigal people of the Euro Nation. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us virtually for this launch event tonight. I'm very excited to launch issue 443, which is the journal's second and final part thematic, part journal issue of 2021. It comprises six articles, which focus on the issue's key theme, big technology and the law, and six general component articles, which examine a range of other topics. Tonight's launch will feature a keynote speech by Mr. Rod Sims, the chair of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. It will also feature Q&As with some of the authors who have contributed to the special edition. I would like to start by introducing the theme of this issue. When I was brainstorming ideas for potential theme last year, I knew quite early on that I wanted to propose a theme related to technology and the law. Technology has had a massive impact on my life and on the lives of so many other people. It is probably the case that most of you joining us here tonight, if not all of you, have used the products and services of the largest technology companies in the world. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google. At the same time, as I read more about what was happening around the world in technology space, a certain theme began to emerge. And that theme was related to the size and dominance of big tech companies, the various issues that their immense economic and market power create, and the ways in which regulators from different jurisdictions were grappling with these very complex issues. These issues created by big tech companies are related not only to competition law, but also extend to other areas, including, but not limited to, privacy, data rights, politics, and dis disinformation. These issues are relevant to the commercial world, to politics, and to all of us as consumers. I'm very excited that each article and thematic component of issue 44.3 has interpreted the theme in unique and extremely interesting ways. The article is built on topical academic discourse on the regulation of digital platforms and technology in commercial and political contexts. They explore a diverse range of issues, including the inadequacy of existing merger law in addressing nascent digital competition concerns, the protection of children's best interests in the context of ad tech, the capacity of the United Nations Convention on Contracts for International Sale of Goods to regulate international trade in non-software data, disseminative competition as a key functional dimension in copyright markets, the changing nature of political participation and the regulation of contemporary digital politics, and the challenges of and potential reforms for regulating disinformation and deepfakes. Issue 44.3 also features an exceptional selection of general component articles, which discuss the challenges associated with the use of automation, and administrative decision making, an improved model for Australia's fintech sandbox, the subversion of the rule of law to avoid the granting of permanent protection to refugees, analysis of environmental, social and governance resolutions in the context of the legal framework for shareholder resolutions in Australia. Proposed reforms for regulating police body worn cameras. And the potential in the affirmation republic with an extra constitutional declaration 
that reflects Australia's history and values, including the nation's Indigenous inheritance and British heritage. I'm very fortunate to have had this opportunity to oversee the publication of issue 44.3. There are a great number of people who have contributed to this issue and to whom I am deeply grateful. Firstly, I would like to start by thanking the authors for entrusting the journal with their work. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to oversee such exceptional articles through to publication. And I've really enjoyed working with each of you. I'm also greatly indebted to the anonymous peer reviewers whose feedback and expertise were vital to the selection and curation of articles and ensuring and to ensuring that the journal continues to contribute to contemporary legal issues. I am deeply grateful to Mr. Rod Sims for agreeing to write the foreword and delivering the keynote speech for this launch. The journal is honored to have Mr. Sims providing his insights into these very topical issues. I would also like to thank our premier sponsor, Alan's, for supporting this virtual launch tonight. I'm incredibly grateful for the continued guidance and support of our faculty advisors, Professor Rosalind Dixon and Professor Gary Edmund, whose advice on a wide range of issues has been instrumental in the strategy and operation of the journal. I would like to thank Professor Andrew Lynch, the Dean of the University of New South Wales Faculty of Law and Justice for his continued support of the journal. I'm also very grateful to Professors Leary Bennett Moses and Deborah Healy, the special faculty advisors for the thematic component of this edition, whose expertise and advice on the editorial process were invaluable to the curation of this edition. Thank you also to Rosalind Lyria and Dr. Catherine Kemp for your generosity in providing advice on my thematic proposal and call for submissions. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to every person on the editorial board. It is no easy feat to meticulously check each and every single proposition in pinpoint reference and in an article that spans a few thousand words. It would simply not have been possible to produce this issue without your incredible work and sharp eyes. I'm immensely grateful for your patience and commitment and for the effort and countless hours you have dedicated to these edits. My warmest thanks must go to my fellow executive members. I am very grateful for your support, humor and friendship, which have made the editorial process extremely rewarding. I've learned so much from all of you. And for the first of my university degree, I've looked forward to weekend IM meetings. I would like to particularly thank our exec executive editor, Tina Wu. Your encouragement and advice have made a world of difference to me throughout the process. Finally, thank you to my family, friends and partner for supporting me tirelessly throughout this last year. As always, I'm immensely grateful for your unwavering encouragement, warmth and support. Our keynote speaker for tonight, Mr. Rod Sims, is the longest serving chair of the ACCC. Prior to his appointment to the ACCC, he was the chairman of the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal of New South Wales, commissioner of the National Competition Council, chairman of Infraco Asia, and a member of the Research and Policy Council of the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. It is my pleasure to now hand over to Mr. Sims to deliver his keynote speech. Good evening. I'm delighted to launch this issue of the of UNSW's Law Journal with its theme on big technology and the law. The really excellent articles cover so many important issues that, that arise in the digital economy. Uh, I commend you all and clearly the level of academic debate and discussion is as strong as ever. The articles cover children's data rights, 
how our merger laws do and do not work in digital markets, uh, the regulation of international data trade, copyright and competition law, issues from increasing automation, uh, technology and politics, deep fakes, you name it, it's all there. It's an excellent breadth of coverage. These broad issues have been somewhat enlivened in political debate with recent testimony of a former Facebook executive and statements from our Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Communications on whether or not digital platforms should be seen as publishers. This is a huge issue and just keeps this whole uh, big technology and the law debate continuing. If there's a common theme of the articles, it is that the law needs to evolve to keep up with our rapidly shifting digital world. Given this, I thought tonight I would give you the ACCC's perspective on these issues, uh, particularly looking at these things from a competition law angle. The large digital platforms have brought <clears throat> huge innovation that we all enjoy. And of course, we must acknowledge that. Um, but it seems also clear that there are some problems. The digital platforms now dominate in key sectors of the economy, which brings its own issues. Also, there's many allegations of anti-competitive behaviour where they're seeking to uh, maintain, entrench their dominant position and suppress competition. The digital platforms often describe themselves as almost benevolent institutions, but of course they're not that, they're profit-making companies, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you don't get to be trillion dollar plus companies without being a profit-making company. And of course, another thing to keep in mind is there's a lot of future growth built into their share price. So that if their profits, for example, were to stay at their current levels and not grow, their share price would more than halve. So they have this incredible incentive to boost their profits. And of course, uh, I think they're doing so in ways that uh, seek to block their competitors. So there's a growing list of issues from an ACCC perspective. In search, Google has 95% market share, uh, partly to maintain that. It pays Apple and other OEMs huge amounts of money to be the default search engine. The concern is a loss of innovation. Uh, for example, different business systems that focus more on privacy, think of DuckDuckGo, but there's other ways in which search engines do uh, innovate, but very hard to get a look in when Google's got 95% of search and is paying enormous sums of money to be the default search engine. Also, I think you can look at a degradation of service. That is the decreased number of organic searches uh, on Google uh, is also an issue and one that of course gets worse when you're not facing competition. In relation to apps, uh, you've got uh, which are dominated by Google and Apple. Uh, you've got, uh, and of course, apps are increasingly being used even to watch television. Um, so, but, but just increasingly used for everything. We've all got numerous number of apps on our phone. But uh, Apple and Google do charge 30% fees for certain apps. Um, they require payment through their um, own system, so Apple requires you to pay through Apple Pay. And of course, there's allegations of biasing towards their own apps. Uh, think uh, Apple Music versus Spotify. In the ad tech market, uh, you also have a 30% fee taken by Google that dominates that market. Uh, and there's also allegations of anti-competitive conduct. For example, when various website publishers got together to try and improve uh, their rates, uh, Google closed that down. Also, Google, with its dominance, works on both sides. So Google will often be working for the advertiser, trying to get the most ads for its dollar, and working for the publisher, trying to get the most money for its space. And of course, you can't do both. Facebook dominates social media. 
Uh, we have issues of fake news, scams and, and the like. And of course, I mentioned the recent testimony from the former Facebook executive. You've got huge data issues, which different people have different views on. But of course, the profiling that goes on um, uh, can, oh, obviously it's there for advertising, but can also be used uh, in elections and in our society generally in ways that some are very concerned about. And of course, you've got massive number of acquisitions done by the digital platforms. From 2008 to 2018, the top five digital platforms acquired 431 companies. They paid $156 billion for them. And clearly acquisitions have really helped them a lot. You think of Google, it's acquired double click in the ad tech market, YouTube, Android, of course, which gives it the source of enormous power. Uh, and Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and, and the like. Now at the ACCC, we're using three tools to deal with these issues. Uh, one is monitoring the behavior of the platforms. We put our report out uh, about a year ago, um, uh, 15 months ago, on digital platforms. I'm proud to say it got a lot of worldwide attention because it was so comprehensive, uh, probably as comprehensive, well, certainly as comprehensive as any report of its kind in the world. So that's been very powerful. We're on net, we're now got a five year monitoring uh, inquiry mandated by the government, which allows us to use our information gathering powers yet again. So we've put out reports on apps. We've got one out on ad tech. We'll shortly have one out on choice screens. So this monitoring is really powerful. It shines a light on what's going on, which is relevant in Australia and all around the world. And I'm proud to say, as I said before, Australia, I think is a leader in the monitoring work we're doing of the digital platforms. Secondly, of course, there's enforcement action. We've got three consumer law cases in court, uh, but of course the EC in particular, European Commission has a lot of cases. Uh, the French do as well, the Germans, uh, so there's a lot more action in Europe. They're leading the, uh, the legal action, uh, and that is certainly uncovering various allegations and proved um, uh, illegal behaviour. And finally, there's a lot of discussion internationally about using ex ante regulation, that is rather than relying on enforcement activity where you look to see whether someone's breached the law and then you take action. This allows you instead to um, uh, have rules there that, that tell you what you can and can't do uh, up front. So very, very different uh, uh, system. Now, a couple of points to note. Firstly, a lot of countries are considering ex ante regulation. Um, Germany, Korea and Japan have already got laws in place. For example, Korea recently passed a law saying that Apple and Google can't force app developers to use their payment systems. So Apple Pay can't force apps to use Apple Pay if anybody wants to make a, an in-app purchase. That's a very profound change. But Perhaps more importantly, there's changes, uh, laws out for discussion in Europe uh, and in the UK uh, in relation to um, uh, upfront rules about what the platforms can and can't do. And they're much, they're very comprehensive. And in the US, of course, you've got five laws before Congress uh, seeking to regulate the platforms in various ways, both ex ante and also changing ex post laws. The second point to note is that, of course, Australia has many regimes that impose upfront laws, obviously in banking and electricity, but perhaps most relevant, the Competition Consumer Act has parts 11A and 11, sorry, 11B and 11C, which apply to telecommunications. And so uh, there's a range of um, uh, things that uh, uh, the telcos can't do. Uh, there's a range of steps we, the ACCC, can take that aren't available 
under general law, they're just specific to telco. So we have done it before. The next step for the ACCC is uh, as part of the five year monitoring inquiry. Next year, we'll be halfway through that five year inquiry. We're planning to put out a report that assesses whether we should have ex ante regulation of digital platforms to deal with competition and consumer issues. And secondly, whether uh, the, the form that regulation uh, should take if indeed we determine it's needed. So it's a very important lot of work we're going to be doing for the rest of this year and early next uh, and most of next year. Uh, it's really going to pull together all the things we've found, the potential harms we've recognised, think about what's the best way to do it. So uh, that report should be out at the end of September in 2022, and we're going to have uh, papers out. We welcome uh, all the cooperation and comments from uh, people listening to this. So I think we will end up in Australia with regulation upfront ex ante regulation of the digital platforms across a wide range of fronts. I mean, obviously, we've already got it in e-safety uh, through the e-safety commissioner. Uh, there's discussion, as I mentioned, about whether the platforms are a publisher and things to do with defamation laws. But I think we'll also have upfront rules guiding what the platforms can and can't do in relation to competition and consumer issues. I think that's because we're concerned about lack of innovation. Uh, we don't want a small number of companies to control all innovation on the internet. We're concerned about excessive pricing. We're concerned about limited consumer choice, different business systems they might want to adopt. And we're concerned about uh, a range of uh, data issues. The other reason why I think we'll have upfront laws is because if we don't, we'll be out of step with the rest of the world. They will come into place in the EC. They'll come into place in the UK. I think there will be changes of law in the US. So we need to get on board with that. Now, we're doing a lot of work with our international counterparts to make sure that when we come out next year uh, with suggested law changes for ex ante regulation of digital platforms in relation to competition and consumer issues, that they align as much as possible with going on, what's going on overseas. That will both um, mean there's less friction between different laws around the world, but will also make the laws more powerful because they'll apply in a range of countries. So look, my thanks to the authors uh, who've put together this issue. My thanks to UNSW for the invitation to uh, write the forward, which I was delighted to do and give this presentation today. Uh, I'm sorry it's virtual, but uh, probably next month it can be in person, but for now, virtual. But these issues are so important for today and so important for tomorrow. They're important for our economy, our society, our personal lives, our democracy. So um, they're really here and now issues that it's very important to get right. So please keep your interest in these issues up. Thanks, as I say, for the privilege of being involved with this issue, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So today we have here with us Megan Richardson, Moira Patterson, and Damien Clifford. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Megan, Moira, and Damien. Um, so today uh, they're here to speak to us about their article, Ad Tech and Children's Data Rights, which they co-authored with Lisa Archbold and Norman Witzleb. Um, so could you please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what your article is about? So I'm introducing all of us in the session. I'm Megan uh, Richardson, and then uh, with us today is my colleague Damien Clifford, uh, who's another privacy scholar, as well as Moira Patterson, uh, who's been working for a very long time on privacy and data protection issues. I'm at Melbourne University, Damien's at the ANU and Moira was, uh, is a professor emeritus or an adjunct professor at Monash. And our other colleagues, Lisa Archbold, was or is currently just finishing up her PhD with me at Melbourne and is at the OAIC as well working. 
And Norman, who was at Monash, is now at uh, the Ch uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. So we're all over the place at the moment. Um, so no, that's great. Um, and so what does your article, um, uh, what is the focus on? So the focus is on ad tech as a proliferation of technologies and practices and companies bringing them together. Uh, Damien is really the technology expert who could explain the depth of that to you if you wanted to go into it later on. Uh, but we were particularly interested in this group in looking at how this phenomenon uh, that's been coming up and such a powerful phenomenon now is impacting on privacy and data protection and is also more particularly impacting on children who are often the receivers of these advertisements and the practices associated with them. So that was our interest and that's uh, the article that we were really focusing on and it was an opportunity for us to bring together um, very diverse interests in privacy and technology and uh, children's rights. Um, I think you started answering my next question, which is how you came up with the idea for this article and also how you all came to work together as well. Well, we've all been uh, working together in various ways for quite a long time now. So Moira and I have worked historically together. And Moira, of course, being at Monash with Norman, they have done a lot of projects mm -hmm. together. And recently they've been doing projects on children's rights, privacy rights particularly. Damien is someone that I have been fortunate to get to know when he came to Australia from, uh, from Belgium, from Europe, uh, where he was uh, finishing up his PhD and he spent some time at Melbourne Law School before he went to the ANU. So we've been talking a lot about privacy and data protection and especially European standards versus Australian standards versus US standards, which is a big focus of this article as well. It's very comparative uh, in its focus. And also we've been talking about law reform issues and that's another big focus of this article, mm -hmm. what, the step, what the legal approaches should be as well. And then of course, I've known Lisa uh, for a very long time and we've been totally interested in her work on children's privacy. And I've been working on and off with Norman as well. So it's really, it's just like a perfect opportunity for, to bring the whole group together. And when we saw this special issue of the uh, New South Wales, University of New South Wales Law Journal on uh, technology uh, or big technology in the law, we just thought that was a perfect opportunity to do something in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your article is very um, topical and very interesting, covers a very important um, and quite debate, like a lot of area, uh, there's a lot of debate in this area at the moment. Um, so thank you for that, Megan. Moving on to the next question. Um, so your article emphasizes the importance of child's autonomy in the consent giving process. Um, but as I'm sure you can relate, often the information that we're provided at the stage um, is either too complex to understand. So for example, we have a lot of terms and conditions uh, when we're giving consent to different um, like privacy agreements online, or they're a little bit too sparse. So for example, the I accept all cookies. Um, so to me, there seems to be a missing step in this autonomous consent giving process. How are children expected to exercise agency in providing informed consent if the information they're given is not accessible to them in the first place? Do you think that there should be specific standards in the way ad tech information is provided to children? Uh, well, I think I might take this one at least as an initial stab and um, Moira and Megan can come in then afterwards. Um, well, I think our argument was uh, nuanced, I suppose, in response to this argument. Um, or like, I suppose in response to this question, I can present our nuanced argument in the article. Um, I guess there were kind of two parts to what we were suggesting. The first is that generally within policy developments, there's been an awful lot of emphasis placed on parental consent as the solution to this problem. And what we're suggesting is that when you take a children's rights approach to this, keeping in mind, uh, for instance, the best interest of the child as a guiding principle, that parental consent mechanisms uh, don't really respect, I suppose, the autonomous decision-making capacity of children and their uh, you know, right to development, et cetera. Um, so when you factor all those things in, uh, you do have to take into account the autonomous um, uh, decisions of the child and their role in decision making around the use of their data. At the same time, then, I suppose we also argued that, um, you know, more needs to be done uh, to create an environment in which uh, consent can actually operate. Um, and in the context of uh, children and ad tech, um, you know, uh, I suppose uh, we suggest that a lot more needs to be done in order to reflect the best interests of the child. 
Um, in particular, I suppose that um, there may need to be an interface with some consumer protection guarantees to ensure that uh, certain data practices don't happen in the context of the use of uh, children's personal data. Um, uh, we take, I suppose, uh, some account of um, some international guidance in this regard. For instance, the Irish Data Protection Authority has issued a guidance on use of uh, children's data uh, in which uh, essentially they suggest that it would, uh, you know, any uh, profiling of children would have to really respect the best interests of the child. Um, and uh, I suppose in the context of ad tech, that would place quite a heavy burden on any uh, operator uh, to um, legitimize uh, extensive data gathering in that context. Um, so um, I, I guess that kind of is initial response. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Megan and Moira want to add something to it, but I, I think it kind of positions, I suppose, uh, our core argument running through the, the article. Yes, no, I think that's a pretty good um, summary, Damien. I think, um, yeah, what, what we bring or what we're really emphasising is that children's rights perspective and that, that, that does include respect for the autonomy of the child, but that doesn't mean uh, that we're advocating uh, reliance on the sort of traditional consent model uh, for, for certainly in the case of, of uh, younger children. Um, and, so, and so that does involve um, shifting the onus in a sense onto uh, the, uh, the platforms uh, to, to, to demonstrate that what they're doing is in fact in the interest of the child. Yes, I, I would say I totally agree with what my colleagues have said. And I do think we did care at the same time about trying to improve the agency of children by increasing transparency and providing more mechanisms for children to really have a say in this, uh, so rather than their parents speaking for them. I mean, parents care about their children, but it's very important we feel for, and this is consistent with all the literature that children also have agency in this space as well. So, so we would want to suggest that we uh, are not thinking about agency, but it's rather that we had a multi-pronged approach that we were advocating in this article. Mm -hmm. And I think it's particularly as guided by kind of a precautionary approach as well. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, taking inspiration some, from some other scholars who've been writing in this space as well, uh, uh, particularly some European um, academics writing about mm. um, the role for the precautionary principle, which mm. seems to uh, really um, have its home in more environmental law, but has been increasingly uh, used as a principle in this space as well to... Uh, help guide policy making, or at least suggested reforms uh, in this area. Yep. Thank you for that very detailed answer, um, Damien, Moira and Megan. So I think that flows on quite well to the next question um, where you do, so you talk about your uh, multi-pronged model um, and how there's that element of consent and agency and also the best interest of the child. And I was wondering how that applies in a real life um, context. So for example, Facebook recently, they announced, so it's actually postponed development of an Instagram's kids, uh, Instagram kids service that they had designed for children aged 13 years old or younger. Um, and the app would require parental permission to join. It would forego ads and carry more age appropriate consent and features. Um, and the head of Instagram defended this concept by saying that the reality is that kids are already online. And we believe that developing age appropriate experiences for them um, is far better for parents than where we are today. And so if, even if Instagram Kids doesn't necessarily contain ads, um, the uh, Facebook is uh, for very much likely collecting data from its users. So what are your views on this type of app that's designed specifically for children? And I suppose, how does your, um, how could your multi-prong model apply here? Perhaps if I just get started, um, I think first I just want to make the point that this issue isn't just confined to, to Instagram or Facebook. And then our research suggests it's, it's far more broad ranging. Um, I think it's important always to bear in mind that the privacy threat um, can come from the service provider themselves and their collection um, rather than uh, disclosure to third parties or targeted advertising. 
and that that, that applies in, in in a multitude of situations. And the difficult issue is the one of balancing the, the strong need to protect children's privacy um, and well-being with, with their other competing rights um, and, and minimising restrictions of their autonomous access to the internet while bearing in mind, as Damien stressed, the, the, the precautionary principle because of what is at stake in, in that um, scenario. And the collection of personal information, of course, poses new risks um, in the era of big data and AI, um, including risks of manipulation, discrimination, that, that can have substantial implications for children. Um, Damien, did you want to add, I think you had some points you wanted to add to? Yeah, um, like I suppose, I mean, I think you've, kind of covered uh, a lot of it there, Moira, I suppose. I, I mean, I, maybe just to re-emphasize that, you know, I think the point that was probably uh, within this question, yeah, so that even if they're uh, removing the targeted advertising, they're, they're not actually removing the extensive data collection. And that kind of goes back to what Moira was suggesting around, you know, uh, adherence to uh, principles such as data minimization uh, and then the risks that can stem from uh, pervasive gathering. Um, like, I suppose uh, there's one point of nuance maybe to add in that, um, you know, you have, uh, I mean, any service is going to be, uh, require the collection of data in order to provide that service. It's a question, I suppose, as to whether they're collecting uh, information beyond what is required merely to provide the service itself. Uh, and then I suppose the elements that are contained in that service and whether they are in the best interest of the child. Um, so you kind of have to get into the weeds of it in order to figure out whether um, uh, I suppose the service is actually designed in the interest of the child or whether it's a kind of a, a surface layer um, a kind of a thing that is still kind of very much in the interest of the business, I suppose. Um, and you do have like legitimate competing interests here. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's a broader policy debate that needs to happen, um, certainly within the reforms that are, are currently happening. And, and actually, just to add to that, I think it's already going on. I mean, this is, I absolutely agree with my colleagues. And just to add that, we are, the Instagram and Facebook example that you refer to, Lydia, and just shows that this is an ongoing debate. And uh, hopefully we'll start to see some real reforms happening, not just in Australia, but also in the US and Europe and the UK and other jurisdictions, because, I mean, it's really an international or global problem. It's not just an issue within Australia, of course. Thank you so much for that. Um, it definitely sounds like there are a lot of challenges um, around regulating uh, children, uh, sort of ad te ad advertising technology for children and their data rights as well. Um, so what do you think are the other sort of big questions that could be explored further in this area? Um, well, maybe I can take a stab at them. Uh, unless, Megan, you, you were going to go? No, no, you go. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I... I, I suppose, like, I mean, um, maybe to just stick with the policy making theme to begin with, apart from, like, say, the um, challenges of trying to figure out what the real issues are, I think there's also the challenge of um, trying to effectuate meaningful change within uh, law reform. Uh, and I suppose I'm saying that on the basis of the experience that the that uh, we can draw upon uh, when we look at the European Union, for instance. Um, which really, uh, in large part, seem to adopt a parental consent um, approach. Um, and if you look at the ACCC Digital Platforms Inquiry Report, uh, that is also something that's advocated as a potential reform in this jurisdiction. Um, and I think, you know, uh, drawing from the arguments in our, in our article, we'd, we'd say that that's a misstep. You know, uh, you need a broader um, best interest of the child, children's rights informed approach to this. Um, and you know, uh, parental consent isn't a panacea to the to the problem. Um, so uh, I think there's that potential challenge just in terms of law reform that um, maybe um, the, the easy solution will be taken for the want of a better word and uh, that the emphasis will be put on parental consent as a, as a reform um, as opposed to exploring uh, broader avenues um, for uh, more holistic protection. Sorry, Megan, did you want 
Oh, well, I, so I, I would say, uh, looking at my side of it, that these are definitely issues we've been thinking of around children, but they're not just about children. Uh, they're about mm -hmm. adults and others as well, others within our communities and different kinds of communities. And I, I think that some of the things that we're advocating around uh, agency and best interests are just as appropriate for other kinds of groups of individuals. And uh, we should be thinking more broadly about new directions in what we sometimes, what I often call privacy law, but I think it's really much more about data rights. I'd like that language myself increasingly. I think that's an important issue. There are other groups in society who, who, who can struggle and who maybe require greater protection and maybe the best way forward therefore is to protect everyone. Um, the, the problem too with parental consent is that parents often, I mean, there's the autonomy issue, the, the, the relative autonomy of the parent and the child, but parents themselves are often not very well equipped to make these decisions on behalf of their children because it is so very difficult for any individual to, um, to, to really understand what will happen to that data and what the particular potential ramifications of that uh, might be. And the problem with children is because they're at such a very early stage of their life, um, that the, if there are adverse ramifications, they're likely to be magnified for them and they can go to things like ultimately affecting their life chances or shaping their life chances. We could see maybe even if it's not opportunities in life, it might be uh, just approaches to life and the sort of information bubbles and, and, and so on. So there's quite broad ranging issues. And in the case of children, I think there's very much more at stake. Um, and this is a context where even very well-educated people have a genuine difficulty in, in exercising informed consent, as you pointed out earlier yourself, because it's so very difficult to understand um, what is happening um, it, 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 in relation to these processes. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you spending the time to talk to us today um, more about the, the big issues that your article um, looks at and covers and focuses on also the challenges that we still face moving forward around these issues. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Megan, Moira and Damien. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, and also I really enjoyed working with you throughout the editorial process as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, it was great, thanks. Thank you so much. Hi Joshua, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, um, Sylvia. So could you please introduce yourself and also tell us a little bit about what your article is about? Um, so first, just a quick introduction. I am a strategy analyst at Accenture, but I was previously a paralegal in the mergers investigations branch at the ACCC. Um, I've also previously written about mergers and digital markets in a chapter that I co-authored um, in the recently published Current Issues in Competition Law, edited by Gozdenovich and Patik. Um, and now a little bit about um, the article. The article examines the ability of Australian merger law to solve competition law problems under conditions of uncertainty. And by Australian merger law, I mean not only Section 50 of the Competition and Consumer Act, but also the institutional architecture that surrounds it. So the particular problem that I examine in this article is how merger control regimes should manage startup acquisitions in digital markets to ensure that the markets continue to deliver competitive outcomes. Uh, digital markets are under particular scrutiny at the moment, uh, and that's given things like the US investigations into Facebook's acquisition of Instagram, um, things like the publication of the digital platforms inquiry in Australia and, and similar reports internationally. So the article looks at these issues through three key themes. Uh, the first one is the problem of how to address digital startup acquisitions is not straightforward. In fact, it introduces radical uncertainty to any assessment of these types of mergers. Um, economic theory suggests 
two different possibilities for these mergers. On one hand, digital markets have particular economic characteristics, um, such as multi-sidedness and the propensity for tipping. And, and this may mean that digital startup acquisitions can cause irreversible damage to innovation competition in the market. Um, but on the other hand, some scholars argue that it's these same economic characteristics that create the incentives for innovative entry, so that these acquisitions might even be benign or perhaps even pro-competitive. Um, adding to the unpredictability um, is the extreme pace at which digital markets evolve. Um, and it really makes it hard to know ex ante which state of the world we might end up in after the merger has completed. And it's even the fact that the most nuanced econometric models that we have will often present multiple equilibria. And this means that we can't reliably predict the future state of the market, um, if the way that the future state of the market will settle. Now, the second theme of this article is that section 50 of the Competition and Consumer Act relies on the ability to be able to calculate risk but it doesn't properly handle the radical uncertainty that's inherent in digital markets. Um, so as a quick summary of section 50, section 50 is the provision um, in the act that prohibits mergers um, that would be likely to have the effect of substantially lessening competition. Uh, an assessment of section 50 would typically involve an inquiry of how the market would evolve in the hypothetical futures, both with and without the merger. So the approach to problem solving inherent in section 50 has got two key features. Firstly, merger control is rule-based. Um, and by that, I mean that merger institutions, so the federal court, the ACCC and, and relevant tribunals collectively, they adjudicate the rights of merger parties once and for all with reference to section 50. And the second feature is that this rule is probabilistic. It aims to identify the, the likelihood or the chance of the harm arising from a potential merger. And as Justice Middleton acknowledged in the Vodafone case, Section 50 is indeed designed to operate under conditions of uncertainty. Um, but the problem is that not all uncertainties are created equal. So Frank Knight, who was an American economist, he made a distinction between two ideas. His first idea is risk. And risk is where, although the competitive effects of a merger are uncertain, the probability distribution of these effects are, are more or less measurable. And this means that you can make an optimization decision uh, ex ante about whether to allow the merger to proceed. Um, and you do this in a way to minimize the risk that you make a wrong decision. So risk management is really where rule-based systems excel. Um, but the measurement of risk requires some sort of market history upon which you can base your predictions about the future. Now, startup, uh, digital startups really don't have this market history. Um, they're, they're highly heterogeneous and the markets in which they wish to enter evolve extremely quickly. Um, these digital startups can also challenge our very understanding of what competition is itself. So, for example, the effects of a digital merger on price competition, on innovation competition, on, on market concentration, all these different dimensions of what we could consider as competition, they all point in different dimensions and in different directions. So this adds conceptual ambiguity as to the very problem we're trying to solve. So in some circumstances, digital mergers may better align with the second part of Knight's taxonomy, um, what this article calls radical uncertainty. And under radical uncertainty, a probabilistic approach does not make sense. Uh, and this is because the set of possible future events isn't capable of meaningful definition. So this is where section 50 and other rule-based systems just don't perform so well. The third theme of this article looks at what other approaches to competition governance might be better able to solve problems under uncertainty. Now, radical uncertainty requires regulators to themselves innovate to solve the problem of digital competition regulation. 
The article focuses on experimentalist governance as an alternative model of problem solving. Experimentalism allows merger parties and merger institutions to collaboratively craft intentionally provisional solutions to the digital merger problem. And this allows parties to iterate their solutions as they discover novel problems that might crop up over time. Thank you so much for that um, summary of your article, Joshua. It's a very fascinating um, area of law and a very fast moving area as well. Um, so how did you come up with the idea for your article? Um, so about three years ago, I was working at an economics firm um, and this was about the time when the Digital Platforms Inquiry preliminary report first came out, uh, about the end of 2018. Um, and as a result of the, the Digital Platforms Inquiry and other similar reports from overseas, there was a lot of discussion in the firm about how competition regulators would respond to the emerging risk of killer acquisitions in digital markets. And, and this really prompted me to explore the literature in this area over the next few years. Um, certainly my work in mergers at the ACCC also helps me develop my interest in mergers. Um, I was also fortunate enough to be supervised by Associate Professor Yane Svetiev in the development of this article. Yane is a, a leading expert in the area of market regulation and regulatory design. And this really challenged me to explore the role of, of institutional architectures in the regulation of mergers. Thank you, Joshua. Um, so moving on to the next question, I think this question will touch on quite a um, lot of the concepts that you've talked about um, in your early question, your early answer. Um, so in late August, um, Mr. Rodson, chair of the ACCC, he stated that Australia's merger laws are failing to adequately protect competition. Um, he noted that there were four areas which needed particular attention. And one of those areas um, is related to the need to adequately deal with acquisitions by large digital platforms, which includes um, the acquisition of NASA rivals, which is very relevant um, to your article. And um, in your article, you do cite this speech and you also um, mentioned the, some of the proposals that the ACCC um, suggested. And for example, that includes a statutory recalibration of the definition of likely in section 50 to a possibility that is not remote, a provision that deems certain acquisitions involving merger parties with substantial market power to substantially lessen competition and a tailor test that would lower the probability of competitive harm that would need to be established to prohibit acquisitions by specific digital platforms. So I was wondering what your views on these proposed reforms are. Yeah, so the speech by Mr. Sims has indeed agitated much needed debate about the appropriateness of um, existing merger law in Australia. Now, this speech in August was delivered you know, just a few days before the very final revisions to the article uh, were due to the journal. So at the time, I didn't have uh, quite the opportunity to give these proposals too much thought. Um, and, and in the article, I didn't really focus on a lot of these proposals. Um, I do mention a, a number of other proposals internationally um, uh, for reform you know, in the area of mergers. And, and that's mostly because they don't directly address the problem of radical uncertainty. Um, but this isn't to say that all mergers can only be characterized by radical uncertainty. Um, indeed, there's still a lot of value in reviewing the efficacy of our existing merger rules. So I have a few preliminary, sort of very preliminary thoughts, um, firstly about the, the proposals. So dealing first with the proposal to define likely in statute as a possibility that is not remote. Now it's first worth noting that, that likely um, has quite a peculiar interpretation under Australian case law. Um, it's being construed to mean something like commercially relevant or a meaningful real chance. Um, and this is although um, Justices Middleton and O'Brien in the Pacific National Appeal noted that you know, probable is probably the better construction of the word likely um, than, than commercially relevant chance. Um, and this view seems to align closer with, for example, UK merger con control, which for instance, applies a more likely than not standard for mergers. Um, so it seems that on face value that the interpretation possibility that's not remote 
is perhaps a lower standard than what we already have as a commercially relevant or meaningful real chance. Um, this implies that the proposed standard would encompass even commercially irrelevant chances or, or indeed speculative chances, um, which doesn't appear to be a, a cogent interpretation of what likely is supposed to mean. Um, for a similar reason, that the tailored test that requires a lower probability of harm for certain digital acquisitions is also uh, perhaps a bit unconvincing, although there may be legitimate reasons for the introduction of a tailored test for digital acquisitions to ensure that their unique economic characteristics are taken into account. Um, I'm turning now to the deeming provisions um, that's been proposed for acquisitions where one of the parties has substantial market power. Now, when I first heard of this, it did remind me of the, the Philadelphia National Bank presumptions um, in the US. And these presume that mergers that cover over a certain percentage of market share um, are unlawful. So while the US makes presumptions based on market power and indeed internationally, lots of countries use uh, market share based thresholds, the proposed deeming provision seems to go far beyond that. Now, the deeming provision is perhaps a way to aggressively reduce the risk of type two errors. Uh, and by that, I mean the risk of permitting um, anti-competitive behaviours or anti-competitive mergers in this case. Uh, and perhaps this goal is appropriate. I mean, if we consider the potential magnitude of harm that anti-competitive mergers can cause in concentrated markets, perhaps you do want to be that aggressive about reducing those, um, those type two errors. Um, but the proposal assumes that there is a strong link between the market power of a merger party uh, and the competitive harms created by a merger. And I'm just not sure if this link is strong enough to justify a substantial departure from Section 50's traditional focus purely on, on effects. Um, and that last part of the question about experimentalist governance. Uh, while a lot of the literature on experimentalist governance comes from the EU, um, where there is a network of authorities uh, or authority that's shared between the European Commission and the national competent authorities, um, it's really important to point out that experimentalist practices can still flourish in an otherwise traditional architecture um, like we might see in Australia. Now, in the article, I point out that Australian merger law already facilitate some aspects of flexible and collaborative decision making. So for example, you've got your section 87B undertakings um, and informal merger reviews that facilitate this sort of flexibility. Um, but there still remain some blockers in Australia to uh, a more experimentalist governance. And most prominently, it's the role of, for example, the federal court as a final decision maker, which limits incentives for collaborative problem solving. Uh, a more experimentalist architecture sees a different role for the judiciary, a role that sustains an experimentalist framework by, for example, uh, imposing a penalty default on parties that obstruct the implementation of experimentalist processes. Thanks, Joshua. Um, it was very interesting to see you comment on those reforms and um, also build on the ideas in the article as well. So moving forward, I suppose, um, do you think there are other big questions that should be um, discussed or explored further in this area? Yeah, I definitely do think so. So, you know, a lot of the literature on experimentalist governance has been considered from a European Union perspective. So in the EU, sort of among other factors, experimentalist governance really emerged in response to concerns from EU member states about the technocratic nature of lawmaking in the EU, um, and also the remoteness of the European Commission from the very diverse concerns that occur at the national level. So of course, Australian competition law doesn't have to deal with the same um, political challenges that prevail uh, in the EU um, with their sort of single market integration goal. So we would expect the character of any experimentalist architectures that emerge in Australia to develop in a, in a very different way to how they have um, in the EU. Um, 
the catalyst for experimentalist governance in Australia could be very different to the EU. So it could be proactive rather than perhaps reactive as it may be characterised in the EU. Proactive in the sense that it's preparing Australian competition law for the increased uncertainty inherent in reviews involving digital markets. So this really warrants more research into what experimentalism could look like sort of outside of the EU as well. Great, thank you so much, Joshua. Um, it's so great to see that there are lots of different questions that can still be explored. Um, and that concludes the Q&A segment. So thank you so much for joining our viewers today. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Lillian. Thank you. Hi, Nika. Thank you so much for joining us today. No problem, Lillian. Um, so could you please start by introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about your article? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Anika Gawia and I'm a professor of politics at the University of Sydney. Um, and I've got an interesting background in that I have both uh, political science and legal training. And my research really focuses on the intersection between those two areas. So from the political science side, I've done a lot of work on political organisations and participation, particularly looking at political parties and trying to understand how these different organisations evolve in response to technological developments um, and also in response to the changing ways in which people want to participate in politics. Um, and then finally, um, my work on the legal side of things basically looks at how the law has shaped the regulation um, of political parties and shaped their activities, and also how the law regulate, regulates politics in general. So the, the article um, that I've, I've got in this particular special issue really draws on this background of mine and the intersection of these two distinct interests. And the central premise of the article is that while we have a, a fairly established jurisprudence on the regulation of, of politics, especially around elections, and as part of this jurisprudence, we have very, I think, fundamentally agreed upon principles. Um, even though we have this sort of solid foundation, the way in which people practice politics and engage in politics has fundamentally changed not just you know, in the last century, but really fundamentally changed in the last couple of decades with the advent of uh, digital technologies and the rapid um, political and social change that these technologies have brought about. So in, a, you know, in addition to this digital change, I've been seeing in my political science work that there's also a much more fundamental movement away from traditional political institutions, uh, parliaments, the, uh, the sort of the contours of representative democracy, elections in particular towards more sort of novel ways and interesting ways of participating in politics that are not necessarily associated with this idea of formal P, big politics that revolves around elections and parliament. So this is things like um, petitioning online, like boycotts and boycotts, and also engaging in social media um, to undertake political activities. So we're seeing here a real movement of political activity and vibrancy away from traditional spheres of politics to, to a sort of a broader and expanded notion of what you might consider to be the public sphere. And this creates really significant challenges for regulation. So in my article, I basically ask, well, what's the place of, of the law here? Is it to continue to regulate a relatively narrow set of activities that centre around elections? Or as I would sort of argue, to think a little bit more creatively and expansively about regulating um, or at least engaging in a broader suite of political activities. Uh, both you know, in negative terms, so um, sort of controlling uh, the activities that people can undertake, um, but also in, in a positive term in trying to sort of facilitate and expand more on political participation. So in my article, I talk about these three key principles that I think underpin the legal regulation of politics more generally and that I think are pretty agreed upon. They are liberty, equality and deliberation. 
Um, and what I do in the article is try to assess how effective they are when we want to apply them to these changing modes of political participation. And I find that these principles have always been characterised by a series of inherent tensions. So how, for example, do you balance the right of political equality um, with uh, political liberty? But they nonetheless provide like pretty solid normative grounds for thinking about how the law should regulate politics today. And then after I discuss these principles, I draw on um, the more recent work that's been done both in political science scholarship, but also in um, the literature and research in the field of media and communications to show how citizens are changing in terms of their political participation and orientation to show what the boundaries um, of what we need to regulate show how they are changing as well. And so the sort of key developments that I identify in the article and their associated challenges are the shifting nature of how we might conceptualise inequality online, the global nature of political participation that, you know, it, it sort of extends from very localised issues right up to globalised issues such as climate change that go well beyond the boundaries of nation states, and also the shifting arenas for political participation. So um, moving away from traditional institutions like political parties, which no one joins anymore, to sort of more novel forms of organising um, through social media and online platforms. So what this means from the law's perspective is that who mediates political participation and who facilitates it is changing from these traditionally accepted institutions of politics like elections and political parties to big platforms, um, social media platforms, digital technology companies and so forth that have very sort of distinctive and important commercial imperatives too that need to be balanced. Um, so all of this sort of brings into question this fundamental distinction between the public and the private spheres, but also the commercial sphere as well, if we can think about that in terms of the regulation of politics, and really prompts us to think about what role the state can play in regulation where it's no longer the only actor in this process. So it's a very sort of, I think, different way of thinking about how we might regulate um, elections and politics beyond the nation state. Thank you for that, Annika. Very interesting issues and very relevant to all of us. Um, so how did you come up with the idea for this article? Yeah, um, the idea for the article is, it was a pretty much a sort of a natural development from my previous um, work looking um, at how the law regulates the activities of political parties and other political organisations. So I've done a lot of work in recent years on how the nature of participation has changed and how political organisations themselves have changed, shifting away from uh, what I would say is pretty outdated ways of participating in politics, joining political parties and, and voting, to more creative forms of engagement through social media um, that rely on the internet and uh, digital platforms to facilitate that type of political participation. So the article was drew inspiration of that um, from those two areas. And really what I was trying to do is to, to, to prompt some sort of questions and, and challenges for how the law can think about how um, it regulates these activities and how it can broaden debate, broaden participation um, in these spheres, what roles it can play. Um, so the article discusses how participation in politics by citizens has increased through the use of social media and digital platforms, um, as, as you summarised earlier. And it also does examine how digital technologies can produce more fundamental political inequalities based on users' digital political literacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a question from a reader. Um, while the greater participation, accessibility of information provides more equality in the political process for those who are connected online, how do you think this digital shift may impact the dissemination of information and political participation among older generations who may not have such access? Yeah. <laughs> do you think the law has a role in minimizing the potential for disadvantages faced by those who cannot access or are less familiar with online mediums? I think that's a, that's a really um, interesting question. And what it does is it highlights some of the 
the structural inequalities that we often that are associated with with politics and democracy that we don't often think about in the Australian context because we have compulsory voting. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of quite comfortable with the principle that most people in society are entitled to, to vote. And the law at least facilitates that in the context of elections. But if we think about other places, the United States is a great example. Um, we see that participation in politics and even in the electoral realm is really linked to a number of different structural inequalities and disadvantages. And age is one of those, and that sits at either side of the spectrum. You know, the exclusion of really, really young participants because they don't have the right to vote, um, and the exclusion of older participants because they don't have that same access to information. But then it also highlights sort of more um, fundamental inequalities that affect everybody uh, around uh, socioeconomic status, education, um, health, for example, these groups uh, who have lower status are much less likely to be able to participate in politics more generally. So digital literacy, insofar as it intersects and relies on many of the resources that you would otherwise possess that would facilitate your participation in politics, can reinforce these same inequalities. But I think there are sort of two different aspects to that particular question that need to be considered separately. And the first is that access to information angle. And the second is this idea of active participation. Um, the law has always sort of had a, a responsibility to ensure that a diversity of voices are heard in political debate, no matter what medium for political communication is used. So whether this is digital media or more traditional media, and hence we have these principles of equality and liberty that underpin political communication and political expression. And they're also really key to the provision of information. So how this is in turn accessed by individuals hasn't really been the traditional concern of the law beyond providing political actors with the means to reach constituents. So whether this is through the provision of free broadcasting time or access to the electoral roll. So really here, um, the responsibility in the past, and I also think probably on the way, on the way forward, is on the political actors themselves to be able to reach their political audiences. So they, the onus is on them to mobilise citizens and to communicate to citizens. Um, and I think the main way in which access to information should be addressed is through basically education. So to educate political actors and participants that these inequalities in terms of digital literacy exist and that they will need to target their audiences through diverse means of communication that don't just rely on the internet, but also um, to educate political um, participants or, or political users, for want of a better phrase, not just older people, but could include older people, that politics is much more than just voting and that you can have very vibrant and robust political debate online and to actually encourage people to use digital media as a channel for participation. So that leads on to sort of the trickier part of the question, and that is around, well, you know, what should the law do in terms of regulating or facilitating political participation? And beyond a sort of a baseline right to participate in elections for most individuals in society, again, the law isn't really concerned with this notion of political participation beyond a rather narrow and formal conception of participation in terms of elections. And the real problem with digital technologies is that we're seeing very vibrant political participation occurring in this space, but these spaces aren't under our control and they're not under the state's control either. They are under the control of um, big technology and platform companies. So I think the law does have some role to play here in overseeing a level of access and participation as these are essentially quasi-public spheres in the functions that they perform. Um, but it's a question that I suppose is, is relevant for all, all citizens, not just older generations. Thank you, Annika. Moving on to our next question then, which I think is um, quite related to the, uh, previous questions as well. What do you think are the biggest challenges around the regulation of digital politics and also what other big questions can we explore or should be explored moving forward? Well, I think the, the, the 
The big challenge is the nature of the field itself in insofar as the pace in which digital technologies themselves are moving is so incredibly rapid. I think, um, you know, the law has, has difficulty sometimes keeping a pace with developments in the, the technological sphere that are relatively slow, let alone the scale of the, of the developments that we're currently, uh, currently seeing occurring. So this is not just a sort of a, a question for now. It's, go, it's going to be an ongoing question around how the law also can best keep evolving over time as well, because these technological developments are not going to be stopping anytime soon. But I think for the moment, the biggest question is really how you can best reconcile these different spheres of, of regulation. So the, the law's place with the place of um, regulation, self-regulation undertaken by private companies. So they are working to achieve the same thing. Um, the way in which many scholars, particularly those who, who work on this idea of digital constitutionalism, um, have, have seen this progressing is that modes of regulation are drifting towards an idea of co-regulation, where, where users of digital platforms work in partnership with big technology companies to establish modes and principles of governance together. The problem with this is even though the intention is very sound and normatively this idea of everybody participating is, is very persuasive. Political science scholarship tells us that even if it's very well intentioned, this type of regulation may not well achieve what it aspires to do because participation actually is a real issue. So not only in terms of how we define, I suppose, taking an analogy, how we define the demos or the public or in um, big technology companies case, the users, but also um, really acknowledging the underlying commercial imperatives that are in play here as shaping, fundamentally shaping regulation and shaping the different positions that various actors have. But also this very sort of curious um, uh, occurrence that occurs that no matter how much you give citizens or users the right to participate in these types of decisions, they often don't. They leave it open to, to others to take these regulatory decisions as well. So in some instances, you can invite broader participation, but it's not just taken up. And that can create a, a sort of a, a regulatory vacuum when you're establishing key principles. So from a, a, I suppose, a communications and a political science angle, I think a lot more work needs to be done um, to understand this nature of influence and the mechanics that are at play here in the, di the digital sphere. So if we think about influence in terms of terrestrial politics, we often use the trail of money as a, as a key sort of source of empirical evidence um, for the, the power and the, the actual um, influence uh, that is occurring. But online, um, means of influence are potentially much, much more subtle and they can revolve around the manipulation of information by third party mediators. And we ve know very, very little about how this process occurs. So there needs to be a lot more sort of forensic empirical investigation so we can understand the mechanics of influence to be able to better then put in place regulations uh, to, to, uh, to mediate um, and to mitigate this, uh, this process. From, I suppose, more philosophical, but also legal perspectives, I think a lot of um, big questions that need to be addressed revolve around understanding the modern nature of the public sphere, um, trying to, to really conceptualise or reconceptualise these spaces as either public or private, or even just doing away with that distinction altogether, because that is a distinction that has... Um, has really influenced how we regulate politics and provided the legitimacy and the mechanisms for legal regulation. But it's a distinction that may not well be serving us um, well today. So we need to really think through our expectations as a society um, that we have a place to be able to communicate with one another, to resolve and discuss political issues and while the online realm offers incredible promise in this regard, it's also extremely fragile and something that's currently very much out of our control. So I think the law and legal scholars have a real responsibility here to think through the modern nature of the public sphere.
Thank you, Annika. Um, really appreciate you joining us here today and taking time to discuss these very interesting, very relevant and very fascinating issues. Thanks, Lillian. Good evening. My name is Andrew Lynch and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales. And it's my great pleasure to be offering the formal vote of thanks at tonight's proceedings. I express the Faculty's appreciation to Rod Sims for his generous remarks in officially launching Volume 44, Issue 3 of the UNSW Law Journal. Rod's professional experience and expertise make him an ideal person to have written the foreword to this thematic issue of the journal, and now also to welcome the issue to the world, along with the contributing authors who have generously participated in tonight's Q&A session. Thanks so much to all of you for your support of this publication, which means a great deal to the faculty. I also give thanks to Valeska Block and Allens as the premier sponsor and host of this launch. The faculty gratefully appreciates the generous support of all three major sponsors of the journal and the opportunities that this makes available for our students and the very high quality publication that results from that support. The relationship with Allens is enormously valued by the faculty and given the theme of this issue, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge their critical support for the Allens Hub of Technology, Law and Innovation at UNSW under the leadership of my colleague, Professor Lyria Bennett-Moses. This is also the 40th year that Allens has sponsored the UNSW Law Journal and the second time hosting an issue launch event in 2021. Thank you so much, Valeska, for your firm's sustained and generous commitment. I want to add some brief appreciation of my own for the dedication and professionalism of our students in producing an academic publication to the very highest international standards. This is especially so over the circumstances of the last two years when they have been unable to be on campus to work closely with each other uh, and also their academic advisors my colleagues Professor Rosalind Dixon and Gary Edmund, whose support I gratefully acknowledge. I congratulate all who have worked on the issue under these trying circumstances to produce the publication launched by Rod tonight. I particularly acknowledge and congratulate Lillian Wang as the issue editor. This is a wonderful achievement of which Lillian, Lillian should feel justly proud. The journal has, as its current volume number indicates, a long history. The first issue appeared in 1975, just four years after the faculty began teaching. It's important to pay tribute to the journal's significance to the intellectual life of the faculty in this our 50th anniversary year. It also, as an entirely run student journal, reflects the faculty's tradition of student leadership and engagement, which produces graduates with such tremendous initiative and ability. It's been disappointing, obviously, to have much of our anniversary planning disrupted by the resurgence of COVID in recent months. But the importance of this milestone is undimmed, and we have, like the journal team, found ways to adapt and persevere. A very important part of this has been our fundraising efforts to support student scholarships named after our founding dean, the late Professor Hal Wooten, and two of our alumni, Judge Bob Bellier, Australia's first Indigenous judge, and Vanessa Hardman, a wonderful example of the international opportunities our graduates are able to pursue in working with the world's best. Information on all three of these scholarships is available on the faculty's website on our 50th anniversary page, which also features alumni profiles and a photo gallery. I encourage those of you who have not been to the faculty for a while to have a look and find out a bit more. Anniversaries are about the future as much as the past, and the scholarships are, of course, a reflection of this. The UNSW Law Journal has, I'm sure we can agree, a very bright future as the faculty moves forward into its second half century. This is in no small part due to the continued sponsorship of the profession, but also the strength and extraordinary commitment of our student body. Again, I thank Rod and the other speakers for their involvement tonight in officially launching this issue, and Valeska for the generosity of Allens. Congratulations again to Lillian, 
the executive under the leadership of Tina Wu, and all members of the journal's editorial team for this accomplishment. Well done. Thank you, Professor Lynch, for delivering the vote of thanks. Thank you, of course, also to Mr. Sims for providing that wonderful keynote speech, and thank you to the authors involved in the Q&A sessions and for delving into the details of the articles. This brings our proceedings to a close. Congratulations again, Lillian, and thank you to all of our viewers who joined us tonight. All the articles of issue 44.3 can be found on our website at www.unswlawjournal.unsw.edu.au and I hope to see you again soon at the launch of issue 44.4.